Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. If you are just logging in, feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're listening from today. Um, and be sure to select the all panelists and attendees option if you'd like um, everyone here to uh, see your message tonight. We're here in sunny Seattle. My name is Megna here um, at Book Larder in Fre the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle. Um, it's really sunny right now, so I'm pretty excited about that. It's like we've got a lot of folks um, tuning in from California, Northern California, San Francisco, Portland, San Diego, Northern Virginia. Got a Seattleite here in the audience. <laughs> All right, well, we'll just give this a couple minutes to um, give everyone a couple minutes to get situated um, tonight. Um, but welcome again. My name is Megna. I am a staff member here at Book Larder in Seattle. And uh, we are here tonight to talk about uh, Spice Box Kitchen, a brand new book uh, from Linda Shu, uh, who we'll be hearing from tonight. And she will be joining conversation by Brian Terry. So I'll turn it over to them in a few moments um, as folks get signed in. But uh, before we get started, uh, we do have signed copies here in the store. Um, so you can head over to booklarder.com if you'd like to support this uh, author event and buy a copy of the book. Um, also, uh, I'm going to read their bios really quickly, but um, before I do that, I just wanna let you know the format of the event tonight. Um, Linda is going to start with a, um, a demo of her orange spice pepitas. And, um, and then Brian and Linda are going to have a conversation about the book. Towards the end of the evening, we will do a Q&A session. So if you have any questions um, for Linda or Brian, you can drop them into the Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen there. And we'll be able to, um, to read them aloud um, at the end of the event. So we'll try to get to as many as we can, but um, you know, please bear with us. Uh, that being said, uh, let's get ready to welcome Linda and Brian. I'm just going to read their bios really quickly. Uh, Linda Shu is a physician, chef, and founder of a teaching kitchen for patients. She believes that the best medicine is prevention. Her cooking classes showcase seasonal produce, lavishly flavored with spices and fresh herbs. Her food writing has been published widely, and she has been interviewed frequently on television and in print. Dr. Shu has served as the faculty at the University of California, San Francisco and Stanford University and serves on the board of the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. She's a graduate of Brown University, San Francisco Cooking School, UCF, and the kitchen of Michelin-starred restaurants Murad in San Francisco. She also has a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. Uh, she will be speaking today with Bryant Terry. Bryant Terry is a James Beard award-winning chef and educator and the author of Afro-Vegan and Vegetable Kingdom. He is renowned for his activism and efforts to create a healthy, equitable, and sustainable food system. He is currently the chef in residence at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, where he creates programming that celebrates the intersection of food, farming, health, activism, art, culture, and the African diaspora. His work has been featured in the New York Times and Washington Post and on CBS This Morning and on NPR's All Things Considered. San Francisco Magazine included Bryant among the 11 smartest people in the Bay Area food scene and Fast Company named him one of nine people who are changing the future of food. So all that being said, I would love to welcome Linda and Bryant to uh, back on screen. Uh, we're so excited to hear from you, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Megna. All right, I'm going to go off screen now. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, Linda. Hi, Brian. How are you? I'm doing well. So good to see you. You too. Is Are you um, video conferencing in from your home kitchen? Indeed. Yeah. Looking a little cleaner than usual. <laughs> I think we get to see where the magic happens. I love that. <laughs> well, um, before we get started, I want to uh, say thank you to Book Larder for hosting this event. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little biased, but Book, uh, Book Larder is one of my favorite bookstores. 
in the country, Forks Down. Um, love doing events there and just um, the, the great work and community building that you do in the Seattle area. So thank you for that. Um, thank you to Hashit Books and my former editor who is currently Linda's editor, Renee Sedliar, who's just a brilliant, um, just kind and amazing person. So thank you for helping birth Linda's book. And thank you all for joining us today. So um, I, but first, congratulations. I know this is a momentous occasion. This is your first book. For people don't, who don't know, I know a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into this book. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> is, that, is that safe to say? That is definitely safe to say. Yeah, and, and before we get too far into this, I also want to give my thank yous to many of the same people, um, to my whole team at Hachette, and at, uh, certainly to Book Larder for hosting this. It's so exciting for me. And I can't wait to visit Book Larder in person. Um, and also at Trident Media Group and at Mona Creative. And especially a big thank you to my photography team of a photographer, Michelle K. Min, and food stylist, Haley Hazel, for producing the beautiful images in the book. Um, it would not be the same without those. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure I said thank you to everybody before we got into this conversation too far. Yeah, thank you, Linda. So before, so rather than reading your bio, I, I'm going to read an excerpt from the About Me portion of your website. And I really love this. And can you just, for the people, we'll give this several times, but can you just tell us the URL to your website right now so people have it? Yeah, so my blog is at spiceboxtravels.com. Cool. So it reads, my culinary education began long before I became a doctor. When I learned to make quiche in, in an early French class when I was seven, that sparked a lifetime of curiosity of the people and cultures behind different cuisines. Since that first class, I've tried to learn cooking from locals whenever I've traveled abroad. Highlights of the formal cooking classes I've taken so far have included a Nonya cooking class in Singapore, learning to make authentic Oaxacan mole from Chef Ileana de la Vega at the former El Nanjo restaurant in Oaxaca City, now in Austin, Texas, making pico de gallo in a seaside class in Puerto Vallarta, learning to cook the Creole food of the Indian Ocean, mastering the art of baking macaron in, uh, at the Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, making homemade pasta um, in Tuscany, learning to cook adobo and also um, lesser known Filipino classics in Manila and being schooled in dim sum from a master in Hong Kong. Um, and you've worked at the Michelin starred kitchen of um, our, our friend Murad. So, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's quite the culinary adventures for a physician. I, I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, outside of making, uh, we, we know that making quiche was kind of the catalyst that um, helped to spark a lifelong interest in food, but can you talk about how you pursued that passion in your travels um, around the world? I want to know more about like when, when Linda Shu is traveling, how mm -hmm. does she plan the trip, how does she yeah. think about like connecting with locals or even taking formal um, cooking classes? Um, I think it'll be instructive for me and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people to kind of bring a different lens to how we think about moving through the world. Yeah, thanks Brian for picking up on that and reading that passage. It makes me so nostalgic for travel, which you know, hopefully we can all do sometime again. Um, I think I've been really lucky that through my educational and training experiences before I started working um, and then um, being able to travel basically in my off time after I started working, I've just been able to explore my curiosity about the world. You know, I would say that not just with that seven year old cooking class, but with my childhood in, you know, semi rural Eastern Long Island, which was not diverse at all. I really benefited from um, growing up uh, by the National Laboratory where my parents worked and we had all these visiting scientists from around the world. So we would have potlucks and there'd be people speaking all different languages, bringing the foods of their countries or of other countries that they'd visited. And, you know, I didn't necessarily like all of it at the time, but I think that really imprinted me this idea that, wow, people really eat all kinds of different food all around the world. 
I want that. I want to see where that comes from. And I want to learn how to make that, right? Because if you live in a place like many of us where you don't have access to restaurants or to the people who make that kind of food, you can try to recreate it at home. And that's a great way of bringing other cultures and other flavors into your own kitchen. Um, so to answer your question of how do I plan my travel? So people who know me personally know that I'm a little bit type A, <laughs> a little bit organized. So while I try to actually make our trips um, kind of unstructured so that you have that sense of discovery, you know, I really only try to plan one event per day or one, one destination that I need to get to. And then it's the getting lost along the way or what you discover along the way that actually brings the most interesting parts of travel. And so in terms of um, the one thing I like to plan though, it's one cooking class per trip. You know, as long as I'm there for at least three or four days, I'm gonna have a cooking class. And so the way that I'll find out about those is you know, sometimes through social media or I'll ask other people who work in food, hey, I know you went to this place. Do you know of anyone who teaches cooking there? Um, and so the classes can be as informal as the, the hotel couples together a class in their restaurant for me because I asked for it. Mm -hmm. Or it can be you know, at a, a local cooking school. Um, and so the whole gamut is great. I've learned so much from all of those classes. Mm -hmm. Can you just, um, so I, the first time that I encountered um, your travels in the intersection of traveling and cooking was when you were in, um, I think, Dakar, Senegal. Um, can you just talk about that? Because it was an interesting kind of um, way in which you found your way to the, the cooking classes. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's probably a good example of all the methods that I use. Um, <laughs> so that trip, um, I had wanted to go to French speaking country. So again, it all goes back to that seven year old French class where I learned how to cook quiche. I've you know, been a Francophile my whole life. And so when I have a little bit more time to travel, um, I a couple of times I've made them French themed trips. And um, for that one, I thought, okay, where can I go that speaks French that isn't where you would necessarily think of, i.e not France. Um, and so I thought, let me go to Francophone Africa. I think that'll be interesting. And um, one of my roommates from college um, is married to someone from Senegal. So I knew more than the average person, I think, um, who doesn't have that connection in their family about the food, uh, the very complex and delicious food of Senegal and the music as well. Yeah. And um, Around that time, I think I had first uh, made social media acquaintances with Chef Pierre Cham, who has, you know, single-handedly um, championed Fonio, which is a really healthy ancient grain, a gluten-free. Oh, <laughs> I know you're looking for his books. books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gluten-free grain um, that's traditionally been grown in Africa, and so this is one of my methods. I reached out to him and I said. Hey, do you know anyone who teaches cooking classes there? And he said, no, not at the time, but you know, he was so generous. Like people often are in the food world, I think. Um, and said, but let me help you plan your trip. I mean, he literally planned my trip for me pretty much um, and suggested a couple of eco lodges where we could stay. And at the one that I ended up choosing, um, the, the chefs in the kitchen there were, first of all, amazing cooks. Mm -hmm. And they went through great effort to put together a whole experience for me to take me to the local fish market where literally, you know, you see all the boats come in, fre literally fresh fish off of the hooks. Mm -hmm. um, to see that, you know, show me the local ingredients and then bring it all back to the kitchen and spend mm -hmm. a whole day cooking with me. Mm -hmm. That was probably one of the best cooking experiences I've ever had. Amazing. I love that. That's something that my family tries to do. You know, we, we try to balance just like completely doing nothing and also um, activities that allow us to connect with lo local people to learn more about history and culture. Even on our honeymoon, we um, spent one full day at a taro farm and we learned about the history and culture of taro and we took a taro cooking class and all that. So wow. I want to say that to encourage everyone out there to you know, think about how we can actually um, get to know the local environment and the local people. And as Linda would agree, food is such a powerful vehicle for facilitating those uh, connections. Am I right? 
Oh, completely. So even if you don't get the chance to take a cooking class, you can always visit and should always visit a local market. That's like stop number one for me. That is what the center of town. That is where everything is happening. That's where the people are, right? Just like, you know, you go to farmer's markets here um, and that's where you'll run into people. That's where, where you learn, you know, where the best, whatever green greens are, whatever it is. Um, the same connections can be made wherever you are in the world. And I think that's a great way to get to know a place. Yes, yes. So we often hear about these watershed moments where um, life pushes us to radically change how we move through the world. And I know that attending one of uh, my favorite conferences, Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, had a tremendous impact on you, uh, your approach to your medical practice, and just thinking about food and health in general. Can you talk about that awesome conference and, and the way in which it kind of shifted your worldview and how you move through the world? Yeah, I mean, literally, it's, it's no exaggeration to say it changed my whole life. It changed my whole career. Mm -hmm. So I was 10 years into my two decade career so far as a doctor when I went to that conference. So for those of you who don't know, it's an annual continuing medical education conference co-sponsored by the Culinary Institute of America, otherwise known as the other CIA, um, and Harvard School of Public Health. And it brings together all kinds of people in the healthcare worlds, but also in the culinary worlds, and reviews you know, all the most up-to-date nutrition science um, that you need to know as a pr practitioner of healthcare, but importantly also has these has this amazing food prepared by the chefs there and cooking classes in those amazing kitchens. And that's when I realized that my lifelong passion for food and cooking and my professional career as a doctor did not have to be separate and in fact, shouldn't be. Like I, it was like, aha, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I need to make a bigger difference in my patients' lives and also in my own practice to reinvigorate joy and creativity mm -hmm. of how do I talk to a patient in a really practical way, a fun way, um, but a really important way to empower them to improve their own health by eating. And not just, you know, you need to eat better, you need, not, you need to not eat that junk food, but, oh my God, I love this recipe so much. Try this. I love that. Um, I see that our friend David Eisenberg is in the house. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Eisenberg, happy that you're here. Um, so, um, yeah, where are we now? I know that when I first started doing this work, um, it was shocking to me that medical schools don't, or didn't at least, and I know that there've been some shifts, but um, you know, at that time, my sister was in medical school when I first started doing this work. And she told me she did like a four hour nutrition class and that was it. And I know there hadn't been a lot of emphasis on, um, the way in which food can actually help with preventing um, chronic illnesses and just help us to live a more healthy and happy life. Has that shifted? Are medical schools now thinking more? And I know that you know you have like Tulane and others that have been very intentional about incorporating this type of um, you know curriculum. But just in general, do you feel like there's a shift in the field where medical schools are starting to understand the importance of thinking about health in, in, in this way? Yeah, so Brian, you're right. You know, not too much has changed necessarily, but it's slowly changing. I think in large part because of all the people who go every year to Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of people who are out there who love food and love cooking, meaning including doctors, who didn't necessarily make that connection until they went to that conference, just like me. And so as these people slowly move out into wherever they are, they're getting the ideas out there. And I'm trying to get that idea out there for the next generation. So I love teaching medical students and medical residents. And I do that um, with the students and residents from UCSF um, who rotate through Kaiser. And I love that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm hopeful. I think that 10 years from now, mm -hmm. Maybe not all, maybe not even most, but many medical schools will have this as part of their training. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot, but it has to be more and different from what I got when I was in medical school, which was a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, literally my school probably fulfilled the 24 hours that are mandated over four years of medical school. But the way that I was taught, which is the way that most medical schools teach nutrition, is kind of at the micronutrient level, the things that you need to know to prescribe 
prescribe, you know, tube feeding to patients. It was not about food. I did not learn, unfortunately, how to counsel patients about, you know, yeah, you like to eat this kind of food? Well, this might be slightly better for you. This is really the very, very simple, you know, it's not rocket science, it's not brain surgery approach that I've developed over the last 10 years. It's really like, okay, let me ask you, what do you like to eat? What makes sense to you? What do you eat in your family? What do you eat in your culture? Okay, let me point out the things that are good about it, the things that may not be as good. And here, just try this. This will probably fit in with what you like, but be a little bit better for your health and you're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. I know that when you first uh, started emphasizing um, the way that your patients are eating, you had a, a, I don't know if this is a separate one, but you had a, a prescription pad in which you would often prescribe um, different vegetables or, or meals to try. Um, is that something that you're still doing? Yeah, so at that time, we were still actually literally writing things on paper. Now it's all electronic. Um, <laughs> but so at that time, again, shortly after that first conference that I went to, I thought, okay, this might be crazy, but I'm going to write a prescription for kale chips on my prescription pad. So there are a couple things about this, right? So it was a patient who had been struggling with a lot of diet related issues and wanted to get better, um, but loved potato chips. So I was like, okay, you like potato chips? I guess you're a salty snacker. What can I teach you that will help you just nudge you a little bit in that direction? And you can just try it. You don't have to like it necessarily. And I thought, okay, kale chips, kind of similar, easy, but a lot more nutrition, lots more fiber and lots of, of other nutrients. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how do I write this? I could write it on a piece of paper. And I'm like, oh, but I have this prescription pad here. Mm -hmm. And by signing that prescription, that is saying that, you know, this is as important for your health as any pill mm -hmm. that I could give you, maybe more important. And so it felt kind of, you know, radical to do that, <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed that. So now that we've converted to all electronic everything in medicine, including electronic prescriptions, um, it's actually easier to keep a few recipes um, in, my, in my system that I can just send off to whoever I want to. And so that's something that I still do. That's amazing. So uh, I think many people out there listening probably know that you have a very popular culinary medicine program that you started in San Francisco. And I know from talking to um, different people in the medical and in the culinary field, their eyes on it from around the country, dare I say, from around the world. And so kudos for that. Um, can you talk a little bit, and then we're going to pivot to the book. Oh, we only have six more. I, I, see, Linda, I just, I want to talk to you and I want people just to know so much about you. So I'm gonna, we'll pivot to the book, but quickly, can you just tell us about the impact that you've seen that it's had on medical students, residents, physicians, patients, community members? Because I think um, I, I would like to see, and I would hope that many of the people who are listening to this, the people who will buy your book, the people who uh, appreciate your work, will then go out and be the voices in community that can help nudge medical institutions to think more differently about um, the way that they are engaging patients and even you know, medical students and, and, and residents. So tell us more about your program. Okay, great. So, and that's a good pivot to the book as well, because the book is kind of a, a stand in for my classes that, you know, for the people who don't live in San Francisco, or who can't come to the classes, they can get an idea of the types of recipes that I teach. So I teach basically seasonal plant forward cooking in my classes. Um, and I started teaching, you know, the early prototype of these classes literally a week after my first attendance at Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, you know, I don't waste time. Um, and it's basically a small hands-on class. I teach all of them. Um, and the idea is that I, it's not, it's nutrition light. It's not nutrition heavy. It's nutrition heavy in that I've thought about all the recipes that I teach in the class, but the emphasis is on the cooking and the eating and the community building by eating mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really what those classes are about. And I find them to be the most direct and practical and you know, literally applied way of teaching the nutrition messages that I wanna to get to my patients. Um, so I, I would love to see every single medical system in the country, if not the world, either have their own teaching kitchen and classes or have access for this. Because I truly believe if I say nothing else about my work in culinary medicine, that if we ignore food as the basis basis of health, then we're never going to get healthier. This is the key to everything. And it's, it brings pleasure back into taking care of ourselves. 
Say it louder for the people in the back, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate the fact that you don't obsess over nutrients and micronutrients. And even when you talk about food, it's, you know, you mention it, but there's not this overemphasis on the food being healthy. And I think that's, you know, obviously underlying all the work that you do. Um, I love that you center cooking um, not only around healthful foods, but also around, you know, joy and community building. And I would love for you to talk about how those things are equally important when we're thinking about having, um, you know, overall healthful lifestyle. Yeah, so um, I don't want you to think that I don't think about the health aspect of it or the nutrients or that I don't obsess over them. But I've kind of done all that work for everyone before I write my recipes. And I very uh, deliberately didn't want to include nutrient facts labels in my recipes because, because I think that then kind of detracts from the pleasure of cooking. Right? Food is such a source of nourishment and pleasure for us and we should never forget that. And I want, I, I want to change people's conception of what healthy food is because healthy food should be pleasurable. Nobody will stick to a diet that their doctor tells them to eat just because it's good for them. We see this all the time. I won't do that either. You have to love the food. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's really, that, that was like my, ah, uh, this is all I need to do. I have to make it taste good mm -hmm. and not, not, you know, focus on it, but be able to talk about the nutrients if people want to know that. Mm -hmm. But by focusing largely on plant-based ingredients, by focusing on, you know, vegetables, um, all the different colors of produce, whole grains that are high in fiber, um, all of these things and you know, legumes, if these are the focus of your recipes, your food is gonna be healthy. You don't need to obsess about it. And I think that's great because if you obsess about things too much, you're not gonna enjoy it. Mm -hmm. that, it's really as simple as that. Yeah, connected to that, um, I appreciate how you um, issue dogmatism. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people might have the question, oh, Spice Box Kitchen, Vegetable Forward, is this a vegan cookbook? Um, and I appreciate that you understand that there's no one size fits all diet. There is no panacea. And that, um, you know, diet is a very personal thing. And so I'm, I'm wondering how do you um, encourage your patients and others to eat in a culture that's always looking for a quick fix, the perfect diet. This is the, you know, and we know that these things shift um, depending on the market demands or the year or the times or whatever. And so can you just talk about an overall approach to more balanced, helpful eating and, and, and not kind of like latching on to these restrictive bad diets? <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I always joke that the one thing I really know nothing about is how to make money. And so like, if I wrote a fad diet, that's a good way to make a lot of money, but I don't really believe in that. Again, I think that people have to eat in a way that makes sense to them and that they enjoy. And I don't think fad diets work that way. The only one size fits all thing that I really believe is that you should eat mostly plants, period. Everybody should. So that can you know, that can be different for different people. For some people, it might make the most sense and feel the best and um, be really important for their health to eat a completely vegan or plant-based or whole food plant-based diet. That definitely has the most evidence for being kind of the best for you in terms of preventing and reversing heart disease and um, other chronic diseases like that. But I actually think that not everybody has to eat that way 100% of the time. There's a whole continuum. The closer you get to that, the better. But for some people, they don't want to do that. It doesn't make sense to their culture. There might be like, okay, so I'm Taiwanese. Our national dish is Taiwanese beef noodle soup. I make that a few times a year. So if you're going to tell somebody that you can't eat that food from your culture that symbolizes your country, that doesn't feel very good. You know, people are gonna shut down and miss the rest of your messaging, even if the rest of your messaging actually is going to be more inclusive than that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important as a doctor or as anybody who is gonna be helping anyone to meet people where they are. So if someone is already saying, I, I'm a vegetarian, I wanna go vegan, I'm there to help you. If someone's saying, I only eat meat, I hate vegetables, that's actually my favorite challenge because. The idea behind this is that I get people to cook more at home, which obviously everybody is doing now because of the pandemic, um, but mainly for the person who doesn't like to eat vegetables or doesn't know how to cook them, to get people to learn how to love their vegetables, to learn how to cook them in, in ways that they love, because um, that's automatically going to improve their health, period, for anyone. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, and I'm excited, and I hope that you continue doing this throughout your um, promotional tour, 
that you're going to be doing a cooking demonstration and actually giving the people some type of uh, some kind of like practical tips and tools and steps. So I feel like a good transition to that um, will be my final question. Maybe I'm going to ask this final question and then I'm going to have like one more thing that I do. Um, but can you talk about centering spices and the way in which you um, see those as an integral part to uh, a balanced and diverse and delicious diet? Yeah, thank you for bringing up the, the other half of my book, Spice Box Kitchen. So <laughs> first I'm gonna show you the, the spice box that inspired the title of the book. So this is a spice box from India called a Masala Daba. You can see the beautiful spices I have in here. The idea behind this is that you have your favorite spices and that you have them ready to cook. So you're ready to add flavor um, to your food. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be in one of these boxes. It can be however you store your spices. Um, but the idea is that spices add tons of flavor. They bring in cultures from around the world. It's a great way to add interest to your food um, and from a health perspective without having to add as much salt or sodium for people who need to watch that. Um, and spices were also our first medicine. You know, they've been used forever. Before we made pharmaceuticals, we had spices. Some of our, what we're learning now are, you know, people have known for forever, like turmeric. Mm -hmm. The active ingredient in turmeric is curcumin, one of the most potent anti-inflammatories out there. And so now it's kind of like going full circle. Now you can buy curcumin in a supplement, in a, in a pill. <laughs> but you can also cook with it. And so while I don't prescribe like X milligrams or X teaspoons of any spices yet so far, I believe in just, just like I say, eat the rainbow of fruits and vegetables, use the rainbow of spices from all around the world, find out what you like, and you'll get some, some health benefit from whatever you're adding to your food in a very holistic and natural way. Mm -hmm. And you bring up a good point that I just wanted to underscore. I think you know, oftentimes in our kind of data obsessed culture, we're always looking for the peer reviewed study. We're looking for the information and, and that's important. And I think it's equally important that we, you know, we listen to the anecdotal um, stories. We listen to our elders. We hear about, you know, you, you talked about how like turmeric is, is, is it's, it's hot now. Everybody's like yeah. putting turmeric in their drinks and making turmeric lattes and right. talking the benefits of it. But you know, the, the, the South Asian aunties and, and, and grandmas, they've known this. And I always encourage people to, you know, think about the foods that our ancestors ate, think about the, the ways that they live, and then figure out how we can incorporate those into our modern lives as well. And so I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, you understand how both of those are at play. I'm glad that we agreed, agree with each other so much, Brian. Thank you for <laughs> summarizing all of that for me. <laughs> Well, look, I, I'm going to, um, I know you need to transition, but I just want to do something that I, I, I like doing at the end of interviews, and it's the, the uh, speed challenge. And so I'm just going to throw five words at you, and then you're just going to tell me your immediate, whatever comes to mind immediately, and then um, we'll keep it moving. So you ready? All right. All right. <laughs> Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Sweet spice lowers blood pressure, lowers blood sugar. All right. Preston Maring. Preston Maring, founder of Farmers Markets at Kaiser Permanente, first farmers markets at medical centers in the country. Medical residency. Medical residency. Uh, <laughs> three very long sleepless years of my life and I completed it before work hours restrictions. <laughs> All right, Senegal. Senegal. Beautiful people, beautiful food, beautiful music. Lastly, dinner time. Dinner. I'm hungry. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Linda, look, I want to just congratulate you again. This is a beautiful book, and that's important because there are a lot of books that are informative, but I like books that are informative and have beautiful images and compelling. I mean, everything about this book is so compelling. And then the, the, the pull boxes, the tips and tools, the recipes are off the chain. And um, I just want to wish you all the best in promoting this. And I hope the world gets to eat your food and hear your words. So thank you for allowing me to interview in your first event. I feel honored. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you for writing the forward. It means a lot to me.
My pleasure, my pleasure. All right, well, Linda is about to take us on a culinary journey in her kitchen, so I'll hand it over. All right, thank you. All right, we're, we're actually gonna be running out of time, so I'm gonna do this really quickly. Um, if any of you are cooking along with me, get your stuff ready, but I'm just going to be demonstrating a very quick recipe from the book for orange spice pepitas. Um, and I'm going to be tilting my camera down, um, so you're gonna see my head cut off for a second, but let's get started with this. And I'll talk you through the recipe as I cook it. So, um, let me show you the ingredients first and I'll try to crouch down so you can see my face a little bit too. Actually, I'll, I'll fix this. This is uh, technology. Um, so first I'm gonna show you my mise en place. This is one of the key things about making your cooking better, faster, more efficient is to have everything organized, everything in its place. So I have all the ingredients for this here I, and I'll show you them one by one. Um, we have our pepitas or uh, green um, pulled pumpkin seeds. We have an orange that I'm gonna zest. And we have um, a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar and some spices here. Some, uh, here we are, there's cinnamon and cayenne. Um, and we're gonna put this all together and make some spice pumpkin seeds. So let's just get started. Um, Cause I do wanna get to your many questions and I appreciate that you have so many of them. Um, so first I'm gonna warm some neutral oil in a pan. Um, this is just some grapeseed oil. It can be any kind of oil though. And you'll want this to heat over medium heat because you don't want your pepitas to burn. Um, so about pepitas, a little bit about their nutrition. Like all seeds and nuts, they add fiber, protein, um, and also some other trace nutrients. Um, in this case with pepitas, zinc, uh, which is really important for your immune system, which we're obviously all thinking about, and also uh, magnesium, which is good for your heart and brain health. So now that I've warmed um, the pan, I'm just adding the pepitas in. And what we're doing here is we're toasting them um, or, or pan roasting them. The oil is going to allow the spice mixture to stick to it a little bit better. Otherwise you could dry toast them. And what you're gonna see as they're cooking is that they're gonna change from this kind of um, olive green color into more of a, a, a tan color. All right, so I'm gonna let that happen while I go through the spice mixture and um, Again, I'm sorry you can't really see my face while I'm doing this. Um, for the spices, we have a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar. So it's gonna be a little bit savory, a little bit sweet. Some cinnamon and some cayenne pepper. So these all just go into the bowl. I'm gonna stir it together here. And I don't know if you heard, but my um, pepitas are starting to pop a little bit. That's another sign um, that they're toasting. And um, you'll see them get a little bit lighter in color. I'll show you what they look like right now. And I'll let them keep going. So that's my spice mixture that's gonna coat uh, the pepitas once they're toasted. The last bit of flavor is gonna come from um, this orange zest. So fresh citrus zest adds a lot of flavor. Um, you also get some of the essential oils um, from, from the citrus um, and so it's a great, kind of very bright flavor to add to anything. Um, so I'm just going to use this and I hope you can see all of this. Um, use my microplane zester, very handy to have, and then just zest this orange directly into my spice mixture. You can hear those seeds popping a little bit more there. Um, I'm not gonna do all of it now, just in the interest of time. This is kind of like fake cooking on TV, um, but it's, it's actually truly almost done. So once they're completely toasted, um, you're gonna add your spice mixture with the orange zest directly into it, and then literally just stir it all together. Um, you may wanna wait until it cools a little bit before doing this kind of in real life, but in the interest of time, um, I'm not letting them cool and it'll just be like this. So just in minutes, um, you'll have these very flavorful, slightly sweet, salty, a little bit spicy um, seeds. And I use these on their own as a snack. I'm gonna actually tilt the camera back up now so you can see me. Um, 
Okay. I use these on their own. Um, I also use them as a garnish in the, in the cookbook. I use them to garnish two recipes. One is a Mexican spice butternut squash soup. And the other is a dessert, which is for uh, pumpkin pot de creme, which is kind of like a uh, pumpkin pie without the crust. Um, and so these go great with those. They're a great salad topper. You can put them in a trail mix or on your granola. So just an idea of um, in each section of the book where I, um, I go through breakfast, lunch, dinner, I also have a pan pantry section to help you create your own things that you can use in your own pantry and mix and match in, into different recipes. Um, so that's it for the quick demo. I hope that all of you will make that recipe. Um, it's located on the Book Larder website for this event, so you can find it there, um, but certainly in the book as well. So now that I um, am done with that, I am ready to take some of your questions. So um, Megna, great. Good to see your face again. <laughs> yeah, if you can you read again. some of those questions to me, I, I would love to answer them. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions here in the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for the audience, or uh, if the audience has any questions, feel, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, let's see, looking at these. Ooh, this is a good one for right now. Amy asks, uh, what is your go-to dish to cook after a long day at work? You know, people always ask me this question, which is a very good one, and it, it's varied, but I think the sort of general idea is some sort of grain. It can be mm -hmm. rice. It can be some, some other grain um, with a few different vegetable dishes and, um, some, and then some protein, whether that's beans or tofu or fish. Those are kind of mm -hmm. typical things. Mm -hmm. um, but the key really is the flavor, right? The, those basic right. ingredients can be flavored with any sort of flavor profile. So sometimes it might be Asian, sometimes it might be Middle Eastern, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes it'll be just really simple when I just want to have kind right. of beautiful California cuisine that just celebrates the produce. Yeah, I love it. And that's where the spice box comes in. So. Exactly. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Oh, go back up. Sorry, my touch screen is a little funky. Okay, um, Mina asks, uh, which uh, relatively simple, tasty, and healthy recipes would you recommend for a cooking demo for patients and residents? Ah, okay. So my go-to cooking demo, which I actually um, didn't include the recipes for in the book, just because I do it so often as a demo, is the grain bowl. So grain okay. bowl is a good example of highlighting all those highly nutritious um, food groups that I want people to eat. So there's a whole grain. Um, there are leafy greens. There, there might be root vegetables. There's some sort of protein. And then importantly, I always teach a variety of different sauces to go with it, to bring the flavors together and make it taste really good. And so the, the, I think that's a really good um, demo if you're a healthcare practitioner and you want to teach patients how to do that, because mm -hmm. you can cook the grains in advance um, so that you can do a lot of education around it with some pretty quick cooking. Yeah. And again, like having the, the variety so that you can kind of mix and match yeah. um, your sauces with your veggies. Um, let's see. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, Dr. Shu, have you ever considered leading some small travel groups of fans, readers, or patients? It would be so fun to tag along and learn from you. You know, that's actually a fantasy of mine. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, I have no business expertise, but if someone wanted to coordinate this, I, I would be game. I, I'm really missing travel now, and I would love to be able to kind of highlight, you know, my method for learning about a place and teaching how to cook those foods with other people who are interested. All right. So the, if there are any uh, travel professionals working <laughs> in the audience, <laughs> so, Contact Linda. <laughs> um, all right, Kat asks, can you talk about your experiences with fermentation as medicine? I remember your uh, tepa is it tepache? Tepache mm -hmm. from culinary school. Um, how did humans go from getting drunk on primitive beer to a million probiotic fizzy drinks on the market? Hi, Kat, it's so nice to hear from you. Yes, so um, tepache, for which there is a recipe in the book, was really like this kind of random um, thing experiment that I did in culinary school because we were making a lot of things with pineapple one day and I didn't want to waste all the rinds. And I thought, hmm, isn't there some, you know, 
could it be a pineapple agua fresca or is there some other thing to do? I had never heard of tapache before, mm -hmm. but what tapache basically is, is like very lightly fermented pineapple peels. And in this case, I spice it up um, with peel and seal sugar. So it's from Mexico. And, um, you know, it kind of doesn't look that pretty while you're fermenting it, like a lot of fermented <laughs> things. Um, but I loved it because this is another example like of what Brian was talking about, folk wisdom, folk recipes, things that our grandmothers and, or somebody's grandmothers and, and aunties were making. Um, they may or may not have made them because they thought, oh, this has probiotics because it's fermented and that's good for our guts. It's that kind of like traditional knowledge about food and also mm -hmm. not wasting food, which we, we do too much of these days as well. Um, so that's how that recipe came about. Um, so there are lots of things that are traditional that are, you know, have probiotics, you know, so besides a tabache, there's obviously kimchi, all kinds of pickles, sauerkraut, all of these things. I think, you know, modern commerce likes to make things kind of new and invent things and make that a superfood, but especially for fermentation, that's one of the oldest food preservation methods out there, maybe the oldest, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you, I think the, the best fermented food, the best source of probiotics is all that traditional stuff that you can mm -hmm. either buy or make yourself. And it, it's kind of fun to experiment like that. It's not hard to do. It doesn't require yeah. special equipment. Um, and then I also like to teach people that, um, sorry, my throat is getting tickled by the <laughs> cayenne, um, to teach people that um, <clears throat> in, in order to have a healthy gut and have good pro probiotics, you also need prebiotics. And that comes from mm -hmm. fiber, which is from eating your fruits and vegetables. Right. They go both go hand in hand. I love that idea of using the pineapple peels. I've never heard of that. That sounds really. Yeah. Yeah. Check out so, that recipe. <laughs> I will do. I also, I hate wasting my scraps. So I'm always looking for a new way to use them. Excellent. Um, let's see. Let's see. So we've got a question about specific um, from Jeffrey. Do you give specific condition-based diets for your patients? Um, example, limiting sodium intake, for hypersensitives or sugar intake for diabetics? So um, this cookbook is meant to be a general healthy cookbook. It's not diet specific. The good news is that this kind of general diet, which is you know modeled sort of a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet and a plant-based diet, is actually the diet that's good for heart disease and high mm -hmm. blood pressure and for diabetes. So all of those groups can follow the recipes in this book, um, you know, and then uh, obviously in conjunction with a dietitian, if you have very specific health needs. Um, and the low sodium part of it is all of my cooking actually is low sodium um, because I, I use so many spices and other flavoring agents like, you know, vinegars and stuff like that. You really, the salt is kind of irrelevant. I use, I at least I like to think just the right amount. <laughs> right. I love that. And as you said, like the, the using of the different spices and the acid and all of that sort of balances out so you don't need to use as much even. Um, let's see. Uh, Mary asks, any insights into how these practices can be adopted in production food settings like food banks, schools, college dining halls, and elder facilities? Oh, I love that question. I don't know that Great I have question. the answer, except that I think I'm just going to answer that by saying I think that people think that healthy cooking is either complicated or expensive or requires special ingredients. And I think none of those things are true. Um, so, you know, certainly if you, you want to cook my recipes, you may need to build up your spice cabinet a little bit. But beyond that, the recipes you can get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, that includes with the produce that food banks will distribute. Um, and I also, you know, think it's good to think about once you learn how to make the recipe the way that I've written it, to think about substitutions, swap one leafy green for another, swap one type of squash for another so that you're not bound to that one ingredient, which might mean right. might be more expensive for someone to do, but with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, and so lots of substitutions can be made as well. And so I think on a larger scale for these, um, these larger community settings, um, providers of healthy food, they could certainly do this. And because um, especially in bulk, mm -hmm. uh, plant-based food is actually I, less expensive than meat. This could be a very scalable thing, I think. And I, I would love to be part of any conversation with anyone who wants to talk about that because I, I would love to see the food that we distribute through all those settings be not just good for you, but delicious. Mm -hmm. Delicious being the key. <laughs> yes. Um, Eleanor asks, what did you enjoy most about doing your book? Oh, 
it, I, I loved the whole process. I loved learning about what it takes, which is quite a bit of effort <laughs> to put together <laughs> a cookbook. I loved working with my wonderful team at Hachette um, and with my literary agency and, um, you know, with PR. I, there's so much I didn't know. And it just, you know, kind of opened my eyes to that. But and I, and I love developing the recipes because the beautiful thing about cooking is that you get to eat your work. Yeah. <laughs> and I also want to give a shout out to all the, I, I had a bunch of medical student and culinary student volunteers help me out with cooking all the food for the photo shoot. And I can't tell you how much food we had at the end of each of those long days. And it was great. Like everyone had food to take home. We all had lots of food to eat. So that was probably the best part of yeah. working on this book was actually eating. It sounds like a party. It's like a party, a party that I want to go to. Yeah, <laughs> Um, all right. So along those same lines, uh, Richard asks, um, does your family have a favorite recipe from your book? I think that my family never agrees on any one <laughs> favorite anything. So there probably isn't one. Um, I, I don't think I can name. I think there are many favorites in there, honestly. Okay. Top top three favorites. Maybe I'll give one from each section. Okay. Um, I know that my kids, um, there's this chocolate banana oatmeal in the California section. They love that. Um, my husband uh, loves the pilau. That's the national dish of Trinidad for which I've made a plant-based version, mm -hmm. which might be controversial. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I have to say that um, my plant-based version of my mother's Taiwanese stir-fried rice noodles is obviously one of my favorite dishes. Oh, that sounds good. And you kind of have like uh, a little bit of each meal in there too. So you could have them all on the same day. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> there's also dessert in the book. People think that you can't have treats. I, I always say you can have a treat, just not that much, not that often. So I have desserts in the book as well. Do you have a favorite dessert from your book? Well, one of the, my favorite kind of sweet treats in the book is actually a breakfast from Morocco called Bagrir. There are mm -hmm. these, semolina, these yeasted semolina pancakes that have millions of holes in them. Um, mm -hmm. I think it means actually like thousand holes, whole pancake. Um, and I made a honey and um, orange flower water scented syrup to go with those. So oh, that okay. is actually like a luxurious breakfast, but it really is more suitable for dessert. That's actually probably one of my favorite treats. That does sound really luxurious. I love the, the orange scented. <laughs> I just, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, oh, here, well, I, we kind of answered this a little bit, but Sarita asks, any hearty vegetarian breakfast ideas? Uh, the family is tired of oatmeal. <laughs> okay. Um, so for breakfast, I think just like with people's snack habits, it falls into the savory versus sweet. Um, so for Let's just talk about oatmeal for a second. So oatmeal, I mean, we traditionally have as a sweet recipe. And I have some in there that are spiced up a little bit. So that makes it a little bit more mm -hmm. exciting. But you can also eat oats like any other whole grain and mm -hmm. have them in a savory like porridge kind of version. And I think, um, you know, as long as your Sarita, your family is not getting tired of just oats in general, that <laughs> is something to think about, you know, have it with, you know, some leafy greens and maybe some roasted squash in it, some nuts and some sort of, um, you know, savory topping, and that might be a whole new breakfast. Um, that is a savory breakfast idea. Um, if you eat eggs, um, there are a few egg dishes in the book, um, some of which are not for breakfast, but I, I think that's the other thing I want to say that for much of the world, breakfast is actually the, can be similar food to lunch and dinner. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, leftovers might actually <laughs> be a way to save you some time in the morning and break you out of your oatmeal rut as well. I am, I'm really a big fan of that savory oatmeal though. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Especially with all the different spices. Um, let's see. There's so many questions. It's like, I'm trying to look through them. Uh, we'll try to get, we'll get a few more in, um, before we have to finish up tonight. Um, here's a good one. Lori asks, uh, which recipe should I cook first? See, I should have an answer for all of these, and it's so hard for me. So I guess it, maybe like, I should say, child. <laughs> for, for I know, for dinner, what to cook first. Well, I have to say that from, um, you know, from the media who got to see some of the early, um, uh, early versions of the book, um, there's a lot of interest in my gado gado recipe. So gado gado is an um, Indonesian salad. Um, 
that can be either a composed salad or a tossed salad that has, uh, for the protein, either tofu or tempeh, um, and sometimes hard boiled eggs if you eat eggs, and then a wide variety of vegetables. Um, mine is actually a, little, a lot more colorful than the traditional recipe. Um, so mine is kind of like the eat the rainbow version. I have red cabbage in it, I have green cabbage, I have spinach, carrots, tomatoes, bean sprouts. Um, and it's all tied together with a really delicious peanut and coconut milk based dressing. Um, so that is a really easy, very flexible recipe. You know, I was talking about making substitutions mm -hmm. with what you have at home. I think that's a good one to start with. In fact, I wrote that recipe kind of as a loose recipe, just a template so mm -hmm. that people wouldn't be stuck with X amount of this exact vegetable. Right. Just have a combination of um, raw and cooked, cooked in different ways, vegetables. Make sure you include the peanut dressing though, and make sure you you'd include the bean sprouts. I think those are key. And then the rest of it is up to you. So it's kind of a hearty salad. I would start with that. Yeah. And I love the interchangeability of it, right? Like use what you have in hand, use what's fresh. Um, oh, great. Let's see. Um, oh, here's a great one. Um, Lorraine asks, what strategies can you suggest for parents? How to raise kids with adventurous palates in a hunger for exploring culture through food. Yeah, so I, I guess I experimented with my own kids. Um, and so a story I love to tell, I don't know if Emma is still listening right now, is that <laughs> when she was two, her favorite food was tofu with fermented black beans, which is kind of a, you know, a strong flavor for a lot of adults. And um, so these are Chinese salted black beans. That are, they're just very strong in flavor, you know, almost, almost like a, a a shrimp paste fish sauce kind of fermentedness. Mm -hmm. And she loved it. So my answer to that is I, I don't believe in kid food. Although, you know, I will make it if someone is, a kid is requesting mac and cheese, that will happen too. But I always just fed my kids whatever I was eating or, or they would just try it. And I think, you know, if you kind of think of food that way, that everybody should be eating the same food at the table, maybe make some a little bit, you know, less spicy and keep a portion of that food separate so that your kids aren't, you know, mm -hmm. necessarily eating the cayenne that's tickling my throat right now. Um, if you introduce it early and often, they'll learn what they like. And um, I think the mistake is not to do that when, when it's much harder later in life to, kind of, it's never too late, but it can get harder to be more adventurous with their palate if you don't start when they're young. Right. You got to start like right away. And like, I love what you said about like, there's no, no kid food, right? Exactly. Like, give them the option. <laughs> you don't have to like it. <laughs> um, all right. I think we probably have room for one more question. Let me um, try to grab a good one. There's so many good ones, by the way. Thank you all so much for um, submitting all of these great questions. Um, let's see. Well, we, we talked about this a little bit um, before we actually started the event. So we'll, uh, I'll share this one last question and um, then let you wrap up any final thoughts. But Heather asks, um, can you share more about Trinidad and a food related experience there? Um, so I tell this story in, um, in the book, um, but I'll just give a brief snippet of it. That the first time I visited Trinidad um, to meet my future mother-in-law, she presented me with a dish which was very special, but was challenging. <laughs> and what it was, was a curried tattoo, tattoo being the local word for armadillo. So the curry part I was fine with. The armadillo, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I could see the impressions, like little lines on it of where the scales would have been. And so that was a significant, <laughs> impression of my memory of the food of Trinidad. But um, what, I'll, what I'll tell everyone who's not familiar with this cuisine is that uh, Trinidad's population is, is very diverse and half of it is descended um, from people from India. And so a lot of the food there is a very, you know, kind of locally adapted form of Indian food, lots of different curries of everything. Um, and it, it's just really delicious. What I did um, in this book is I made plant-based versions of, and, and some pescatarian versions of the foods there, which 
often have more meat than not. Um, and, but I think this is actually true to the flavors and, and true to the roots of the food. And I hope that people will try out that, that cuisine because I think it's really delicious. Um, and it's, again, not as well known um, to many people as other types of food. I know I'm personally excited to dive into that section of the book. So thank you for sharing Great. it. Um, that is all the time that we have for questions today. Thank you again uh, to all of our audience members for submitting such great questions and being so engaged in the chat and just seeing the chat blow up with lots of messages. Folks are excited and hungry and um, <laughs> really looking forward to looking through the book. So um, thank you for joining us tonight, Linda. Congratulations on a beautiful new book. Um, Spicebox Kitchen will be available at booklarder.com for purchase. We have um, all signed copies. Thank you for sending book plates to us, Linda. Um, we will be looking forward to seeing those orders uh, roll in over the next couple of days. Um, but, but that's all I have prepared tonight. Um, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, no, just thank you so much again for hosting me, Magna and Book Larder. It was it's so great. And I do hope to visit the shop in person sometime in the near future. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. I hope you all, all get a copy of the book. It's um, available also as an ebook for those of you who are trying not to accumulate things, but I strongly recommend getting the hard copy because it features the beautiful photography for my team. Um, and yeah, follow me on social media. I'm at Spicebox Travels on Instagram and on Twitter and at the Doctor's Spicebox on Facebook and on my blog at Spicebox Travels. So if you're in the Bay Area, I hope that you will come to my classes at the Thrive Kitchen when, when we're in person again, um, and we are starting virtually. Um, and I think that's it for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good for tonight. And if you um, would like, this talk will actually be posted on our YouTube channel within 48 hours of the event. So if uh, you're in the audience and you know someone who uh, should really listen to the talk, uh, send them over to our YouTube channel. It'll also be posted on our social media um, later this week. Um, but with that, thank you, Linda. Thank you to all of our audience members. And we will see you at our next events. Have a good Great. night. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.